statistics and econometrics. And the book that I used was Mosteller and Light. And it is the same Dick Light that is sitting here. Um, 40 years <laughs> older, but I'm sitting here. 40 years older. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, Dick, is, this is background actually is that um, he, is a, he has a PhD in statistics from Harvard, but he has migrated to spending huge amounts of time working on educational systems, the educational process, particularly looking at colleges and universities. He is the Carl, officially the Carl Forsheimer Professor of Teaching and Learning at um, Harvard Graduate School of Education. And he also has a joint appointment here um, at the Kennedy School. Uh, he really does focus on higher ed and higher ed controversies. Um, as we were going through this, I realized you've advised, let's see, uh, Derek Bach, Neil Rudenstein, Larry Summers, um, Andrew Faust. And Larry Backow. And Larry Backow. <laughs> so, so the last five presidents of Harvard, um, Dick, has, Dick has advised them on, on how to approach the, uh, the issues at the university and the educational issues. Um, he has done Harvard assessment seminars that bring, he chairs and runs this program where he brings together leaders from 24 colleges and universities to develop projects to strengthen something he cares about deeply, which is student experience and making sure students have the best experience um, when they're in college, when they're at the university. Um, he has at least three projects that I'm aware of. Um, the first is um, how to help first generation college students. Um, and in particular, this is with Brown, Duke, Georgetown. Brown, Duke, Georgetown, and Harvard. How do you help these young folks succeed? People who are coming for the first time to college, they don't have people in their family that were uh, in college. I, believe it or not, am a first gen uh, uh, college graduate. Um, and I could, probably could have used some of your advice at some point, but, um, and then the second one, he's working with Howard Gardner uh, and kind of working on reinventing the new liberal arts for the 21st century, um, which I can't wait to hear, hear that work uh, in particular. And then just generally controversies in higher education. You can feel free to come up to the front, don't worry. You're not, you're not interrupting it. This is an informal crowd. Um, he is um, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, he's worked on diversity and changing demographics at colleges and how to address that. Feel free, please come up. Please come towards the front. You can um, put your mask on. That's my one and only request. Thanks. Right. Thanks so much. I don't think you mind me saying Dick, Dick worries that appropriately that he is somewhat immunocompromised. So yeah. he's just asking that we all uh, be careful. Um, My only request. And uh, let's see what else. He's been elected president of a number of uh, various associations, in particular the American Association of Higher Education. So I am ready to be enlightened, as I hope you are, uh, by Dick about our educational system. Please come, straight. come to the front. And you need to put a mask on. Yeah, if everybody can put a mask on, I'm grateful. Thank you. All right, folks. I see. I'm so. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna only stand here for one minute because I. I'm a long time ago. I learned I don't want to put a podium between you and me. The whole point is to make it a conversation. But I'll start this way. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I just want to apologize, and I won't keep doing it. Just one more time. I'm immune compromised. My wife is immune compromised, and we have, I have two sons-in-law who are immune compromised. I just have to be careful. That's why the mask. So, end of story. Okay. Um, I think what I'm going to do is sit in the chair. So I'm sitting, talking to you. Can you? There's no microphone here. So can you all hear me loud and clear? Would you go so far as to say this is stunningly good? <laughs> okay, good. So anyway, uh, the point of it is, let me share with you what I want to do. First, I, my goal overall is to pose a question that I think is an important question. And I just wrote a book about it with a student who's young enough to be my granddaughter, practically. Here's the book. I'll just hold it up once. I don't need to pitch it. Um, anyway, here it is. Becoming Great Universities. Small steps for sustained excellence. And I, I hold it up because um, the way I met my co-author, Alison Jedla, three years ago, she was my assigned as my 
master student advisee. And we got along well, but you know, I'm, I'm 70 and she's you know, 70, a little over 70 and she's a little over 20. And anyway, so she said, I'd be, I'm a good editor. I'd really be happy if you would show me a draft of something, maybe I can edit it for you. And I'm thinking that's an unusual offer, but sure. And I gave her a chapter of the book. Three days later, she shows up, she really made it better. And I'm thinking, this is amazing. Um, and then she said, want to do it again? And I said, yes. And she did it again. And then she began adding her ideas. So in the end, I invited her to be my co-author and we ended up writing this thing virtually. She's sitting at home in Michigan with her mother. I'm not joking. And I'm sitting here with my family in you know, Cambridge and Boston. So the theme of that book is, is the following. It's the Think about American colleges and universities. I know we could talk about, you know, uh, Hong Kong or, you know, 16 other countries or, or you know, Korea, ma many other places. I'm going to focus this on American colleges and universities because that's what I know best. And what I just want to say is think in your own mind. There are so many that are pretty good. It's not like there are two or five. There are probably 700. We're pretty good. But there are very few that you'd really call great. I'd like to think Harvard is one, but there are, there are 20 others, maybe 30 others. But the point is, it's not a thousand. So the question is, if you either work at or are the president of or a dean or a former dean or anyway, at a um, college and a university that's just pretty good, what can you do to make it better? And the keywords at either no cost or, or very low cost. If I said get a new computer system for $46 million, you'll be more effective. That's very nice, but most places don't have the $46 million. So that's what I want to talk about. How do you go kind of from good to great when you are a university? And I'm going to do this with a series of anecdotes rather than PowerPoint slides. I have seven main points to make. My first point is about the importance of having a culture. What makes a great university, which gives students a great student experience? How do you enhance that? Well, one way to do it is to create a culture of innovation. What exactly do I mean? I'm going to ask someone to raise their hand if you have the slightest idea what I'm talking about. Does anyone here play squash? Please. Okay, grand total of one person and you have raised your hand. That's right. Okay, seriously. Have you watched some really world-class great squash players, even on YouTube? Yep. What country do they all seem to be from? Pakistan. Pakistan. Egypt. Egypt, thank you. Pakistan. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to have a series of super short. These are all 30-second anecdotes. I visit my young grandchildren in Philadelphia. They're like 12, you know, 9, 11, 12 years old. We went to watch a squash match, the four best players in the world, two men, two women. And my grandson is looking at the program. He said, I never heard of these people. They have unusual names. And I said, yes, uh, they're Egyptian. And he said, all four? I said, yes, that all four are the finalists for the best in the world. And he said, how can that be? How many people are there in the world? Grandpa, I said, I think about 8 billion. Then he said, well, how many people live in Egypt? I said, I'm not sure, maybe something like 100 million. So he said, like, that's roughly 1%. But I'm, so the probability, the chance that all four would be finalists is like zero. But we're going to watch it. How is that? Which got me to say my big theme. It's all about culture. The Egyptian culture, the kids are all playing when they're four years old, they're competing in tournaments when they're six. Universities that are great develop a culture of innovation. And by that, I mean, they try new things. And I'm going to give you like 10 examples right now of trying new things. So that's the end of my, that's the end of my squash story. Okay, here's an example of a new thing. You all are connect, you're all here. I'm assuming you're all connected to Harvard in some way. What proportion, I'm just asking, a, I'm gonna ask you a fact. 
What proportion of all Harvard classes across the whole university are taught using lectures? What you got? 90%, 2%? This is good. You don't, I guess you don't find the answer obvious, which is good. That means you can get a new idea. Okay. 60%, 70%. In the ballpark. 20, 20, let me give you data. 20 years ago in the year, you know, 2001, roughly year 2000, 74% of all Harvard classes were taught using lecture. Last year, I don't have the data for this year yet, but this past year, 46%. What's the point? The point is a series of research findings based on interviews with students done by a large group of people showed that students were pretty turned off by nonstop lectures. And I wanna give you my favorite example because it's true. I was interviewing a young Harvard undergraduate. I, I think she was a junior, you know, 20 years old. And I just said, um, what has been your experience both inside of class and outside of class here at Harvard College? And she said, well, my experience outside of class has been great because I'm meeting such an interesting, diverse group of people who bring different backgrounds, different ideas, different perspectives from the way they grew up. So it's A plus in my residence hall when I go to sleep every night. But in the classes that I'm taking, my experience is more of a C minus because professors sometimes just drone on and on. Students don't talk. And she said, look at me. I am obviously a white woman. I nodded. And she said, sitting next to me in my history class is a black man, an African-American man sitting on my right, an Asian-American woman. woman. The three of us show up, listen to a pretty good, pretty good history lecture. And then we get up having not said a word, as I see you next week, and they go home and we go home. So how have we benefited from the brilliance and the different backgrounds and different perspectives that all of our classmates brought to class? Anyway, working with seven colleagues, the eight of us turned up that result uh, about 20 years ago. And Harvard has changed. I mean, I could take all the credit, but that's silly. It's obviously not me. But the point just is Harvard's changing as are many, many other campuses. If you go to the Ohio State University, 47,000 undergraduates, they've reduced the number of lectures. There's still too many, but the point is they've reduced it. Good for them. Okay, so that's the first point. Second example, innovative colleges and universities. I won't keep using Harvard, we can use others, but I guess maybe I use Harvard because we're all sitting here at Harvard. Innovative colleges and universities have learned how to give students agency, A-G-E-N-C-Y, I'm repeating it because of this darn mask, um, to help students believe they can make a difference. And um, some campuses really are good about doing that. I think Harvard is pretty good, you know, always could get better, but we're pretty good at doing it. I can, I can name a whole lot of very famous universities, especially a few large public universities on the West Coast, where I have visited. They're smart, they're competent. They, anyway, but the point just is, Students are not encouraged to take any initiative. So let me give you a couple of examples of students taking initiative. These are not made up. Every one of these is true. A few years ago, here at Harvard College, four undergraduates were sitting in, I think it might have been Mather House, one of the undergraduate residence halls, and they were kind of talking over and over about a specific feature of their Harvard experience. They were all, I think all four were juniors, I think. Anyway, they were saying, this is crazy. I came to Harvard because of the extraordinary talent on 
from so many different faculty members and lecturers and researchers. And the only people I'm, I'm hearing ideas from are my professors. And I take four courses per semester times four years, two semesters per year, the eight semesters, four courses, each student said, I'm exposed to 32 professors. What about the other 700? So they went for, here's my big takeaway. They, they went to a dean, a woman, dean of students. Catherine O'Dare is her name. And they said, Dean O'Dare, this is crazy. And she sort of agreed with them. And then they said, we are willing to do some work to make a new program happen. To which Katie O'Dare said, what are you gonna do? And the student simply said, we are going to create an event called 10 big ideas, 10 professors, 10 minutes each. And the Dean said, I think I get it. Um, what do you need from me? And they said simply, we just need you to reserve a room, you know, a big room. She said, I'll give you Sanders Lecture Hall, seating capacity 1,100. And she did. So anyway, they just, so the four students got the permission. They got in touch with 10 professors who they chose. And they invited each professor to come and stand up on the stage. And I'm gonna use the word France, P-R-A-N, because that's what a lot of them did. One of them was ripping up telephone books. Anyway, the idea is 10 professors presented their one big idea. They got Lisa Randall, woman, astronomer. She's fabulous to share exciting new ideas in astronomy. David Mallon, computer scientist. He literally was prancing around the stage, ripping up phone books, making points about computer science. The point just is these four undergraduates had no clue how many students, undergraduates, would show up. You know, no money's changing hands here. It's free. Just show up, just come on a random Tuesday night in the middle of winter in February. They had no idea how many people would show up. Sanders Theater was packed. 1,100 students showed up. And the professors, of course, loved it. I mean, you know, they were so flattered that they were invited and they got to tell their big ideas and they felt quite pleased with themselves. I mean, in the nicest sense. So the point just is the students loved it and the faculty loved it. And these, uh, that's the end of my story. The point is simply, there's a simple short example of how four students go to a dean and the dean says, this is good, I'll help out. If, no, I'm just gonna ask a question. Why is the University of Minnesota not doing that right now? Give me one good reason. And I think the answer is they didn't think of it. You know, in other words, they could do it tomorrow. They could do it next week. Doesn't cost anything. No one pays, the professors are not paid. The students don't pay anything. They just show up for two hours. So there's an example. Um, okay, I hope that makes the point. So give students some agency. Ne All right, that's again, something that distinguishes a pretty good campus from a great campus. I could give other examples if you want, but I'm gonna move on to be sure I cover all the main points. Okay, now suppose I ask you, um, I want to actually, let's do, I'm going to actually do it. Um, Luciana, do we, do you agree? I know, I know your name, but we don't really know much about each other, right? Okay. What was your college major? I have no clue. Psychology. Psychology. Excellent. A good major. Suppose you applied for a job and John Haig was interviewing you and he's thinking to himself because he sort of practically runs the Kennedy School. Basically, he's thinking, I wonder, I'm going to look at Luciana's transcript at college. And John Haig sees a string of A minuses and A's. He says, this is good. This is impressive. My question is, how could John Haig or, or I or anyone else have a clue what you can do or can't do? I mean, you have a string of A's and A minuses. You know, that's, that's good. It looks pretty impressive. 
Could you just put on a mask, please? Thanks so much. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch in the back. Thank you. So anyway, the point just is that um, no one knows what you know. Now, there are a few great universities around America. I could list them if you want. There are a couple of privates or a couple of publics like University of California, Irvine is very good at what I'm now going to say, as is Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and a whole bunch of other places. There's a small college in Iowa called Grinnell College that actually has done what I'm now going to say. Did you, oh, well, you don't know what I'm going to say yet. Yeah, um, John used to be affiliated there. Anyway, the point just is, um, the point just is, suppose I ask, how do we know what our students know? I could ask that at the Kennedy School. For those several of you who are here from Slate, that's what we did about well, know, several years ago. And boy, did we learn a lot about what Kennedy School students are good at doing and frankly, not quite so good at doing. And that led to a total revamping of the MPP curriculum here. I mean, seriously, a total revamping. The four core courses that are being taught right now didn't exist, at least with the same name, a few years ago. So this, this is an example of collect some information and things will change. And I wanna be very specific. There are, there's a word that most professors hate. That word is assessment. If I told many of you and said, guess what? Lucky you, lucky you, we're gonna do some assessment. You know, you'd find some reason to excuse yourself and leave the room. What is that, standardized testing? It's not standardized testing. Let me share with you assessment. And I'm going to mention campus names because none of this is secret. The Princeton University, a great university, Princeton University faculty wanted to know what did their graduating seniors know? So they asked 10 professors from other campuses. I was invited, but you know, there was a woman who came from Swarthmore College. There was a, another woman who came from UCLA and so on. And we all were told, spend one day at Princeton, sit in a room, just you, you know, you sit in your chair, sit right across from the young, you know, the, the person, the graduating senior uh, from Princeton, we'll choose students at random, and ask them about 15 questions, one-on-one. -on -one. Simple questions to get a sense of what they know and what they don't know. Because the Princeton faculty wanted a clearer picture of what our students, do they even know what we're talking about? And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of questions. I arrived, I was one of 10 people, I'm sitting in my room. The first person who arrives is a graduating senior woman, sits facing me with a very pleasant smile. And, and so I just explained to her, this is not a test. I told her the truth. This is not a test of you. I just want to ask you some questions because the faculty here at Princeton, you know, where you're graduating, congratulations. Um, they want to know what the graduates kind of know. So I'm going to ask you some simple questions or some hard questions. And I just need you to give me honest answers. She said, go for it. I said, good. I said, my first question is, just say anything you want for one minute about the, I'm going to say a name, Sigmund Freud. Can you say anything that conveys you have a clue who Sigmund Freud was? What does the name Sigmund Freud mean to you? By the way, I don't know, the Princeton faculty came up with that. That's not what I would have come up with, but they came up with it. So fine, I asked. And the woman was terrific. She said something like, well, I'm not an expert in that, but I think German, Austrian, psychiatrist, early 20th century, Oedipus complex. And I just said, back, stop, that, that's great. You, you have a clue who he is. That's all I needed to know. She said, this is good, keep it going. I said, okay. My second question is the Human Genome Project. The Human Genome Project. I said, it's just our whole future. Just talk for a minute. I didn't say that, Look, I, that would have been offensive. But anyway, I just said, the Human Genome Project, um, just talk for a minute. She looked at me, 
slightly awkwardly and said, I know, actually the first words she said were, I'm an English major. I said, oh, well, that's very nice. <laughs> anyway, I said, but human genome project. And she then said, you know, um, the truth is, I know I should know more about it. And the truth is, I don't. I just, I don't have much that I can, I can say. And I said, fine, don't make it up. So the answer is, you know, that's, you're not acquainted with that. And then, again, at the suggestion of the faculty, I said, next question, artificial intelligence. You sort of read about it in the newspaper pretty much every day, even if you don't use it. What does artificial intelligence mean? To which she said, I read about it all the time. I cannot talk thoughtfully about it for a minute. I said, fine, no, anyway, and she, she was very good on some other. What's the bottom line? The 10 of us from other campuses debrief with the provost, the, the academic leader at Princeton. And let me just tell you, so I'm gonna tell you some real data, real data. The real data is what fraction of Princeton undergraduates on the verge of graduation could say who Sigmund Freud is? 94% the Princeton faculty said, this is good. What fraction could say a few words about um, the Human Genome Project? 46%. The Princeton faculty in a faculty meeting, they had two faculty meetings about this. They said, is this a problem or not? And in the end, they decided there are some things that are pretty basic. We, you know, we need our students to have a clue what those words mean. And so they built it into a whole lot of courses. Anyway, that's the end of my story. How much did that cost Princeton? to do, it. you know, like once every five years, they don't have to do it every week. So they can do it once every five or 10 years. It cost them airfare to fly me to Princeton, New Jersey and back. I mean, that's the whole cost. It cost them very little. Meanwhile, they got tremendous feedback. So that's the value. That's one value of assessment. Um, a, second, a second thing that any campus can do, can you all hear me okay? I'm trying to talk as loud as I can. Okay. Um, a second thing a campus can do is look at changes, changes from the day students arrive to the day they graduate. Suppose I ask, okay, I'm gonna actually try to do this really. Um, would you raise your hand if you went to um, Harvard College, undergraduate? Okay, good. Just to get someone different. Good. Um, this is great. I have a question. Do you, I, I don't know you at all, but you know, I, my question is, do you think that most Harvard undergraduates improve their writing, W-R-I-T-I-N-G, in their four years at Harvard College, since you had the experience? Yeah, definitely. You do. What evidence do you have other than a hunt? Nothing concrete. Nothing. That's true of almost every campus that um, I've ever seen. And so more and more campuses are putting, uh, they're putting out an effort, they're making an effort to measure improvement over time. And I'm gonna give you a real example that was done here at Harvard by a woman named Nancy Summers. The first year students, you know, the sweet, malleable 19 year olds moved into Harvard Yard. Before classes even started, they all marched over to a big building where they all have breakfast, Memorial Hall, and they sat at desks and tables. And um, they got a question and blue books. They could do it on a computer, but it was just easier to do it longhand in terms of the logistics. Anyway, imagine having 1,650 first year students at Harvard. They're all sitting at their desk. It's August 28, a few years ago, and they read the question. We assume you have heard the name Abraham Lincoln. So Abraham Lincoln, at some point in your background, if Abraham Lincoln were alive today, would he be a Democrat or a Republican? You have one hour, write out, write out your best answer use evidence for whatever you believe. I'm gonna stop. Every one of these young folks, they wrote their name on the blue book. 
and you know hack Fred Smith, whatever it is, and they try to answer the question. Now, um, Luciana, do you think Abraham Lincoln would have been a Democrat or a Republican if he's elected? I have no clue. You have no idea. I have no idea. None of you have any idea. That's the whole point. No one cares about what these good young people wrote. The only thing that Nancy Summers and the writing faculty cared about is, let's read the essay. Is the grammar pretty good or is it terrible? Does the essay have a beginning, a middle, and an end? Yes or no? Um, does the person who wrote it use evidence in, um, evidence in some way, this can thing keeps sliding down. Anyway, the, um, evidence in some way to make their points. Do they make a compelling point? Okay, four years go by. Near the end of senior year, the same, now these, these, these first years, four years ago, they're seniors. They were marched back over to Memorial Hall. And this time they got the question, read these three paragraphs by Socrates, Socrates, translated into English so everyone can do it. And they read it. The question then was, based on what you just read, would Socrates have been in favor of or opposed to the modern concept of affirmative action? I can't resist. I'm now gonna interrupt myself and say, Many of you know there's a affirmative action court case in front of the Supreme Court where Harvard is a defendant. And interestingly, I just learned it's gonna be heard on Halloween. That's not a joke. So interesting. Anyway, the point of it is that was the question. So a, a group of graders, a group of outside graders, you know, professor from BU or MIT or you know, whatever it is, Harvard's English department, graded the essays on grammar, beginning, middle, and end. And no one cares about, you know, Republican or Democrat. It was more, is the writing good? So they then presented the results to President Drew Faust. That was about six years ago or five years ago, just before our current president of Harvard, Larry Bacow, became president. So they presented the results to Drew Faust. And I was just sitting in the back of the room I didn't do this project. This is Nancy Summers' project. Anyway, and I watched. And Nancy Summers and her team said, we have concrete evidence that Harvard students, undergraduates, dramatically improved their writing, just as you guessed, over their four years at Harvard. To which the president of Harvard said, uh, do you have any numbers? And Nancy said, yes. The first year students, Average one to 10 scale, 7.2, with some standard deviation that went with it. Um, the seniors, 8.9, with some standard deviation. It's significant at, you know, the uh, 0.001 level. It's clearly a significant improvement. And I kept thinking, this is impressive, good for you. But Drew Faust was not impressed. She just said, well, you didn't really do the important thing yet. And I'm thinking, I have no idea what she's talking about. And so the president said, the important thing is, are there differences between the students who concentrate or major in the humanities versus social sciences versus physical sciences like physics, computer science, chemistry, earth and planetary science, things like that. To which the writing group said, we didn't look at that but it'll be easy to do. And they did, and they came back. And when they came back, they said, wow, we found some surprising results. We learned humanities undergraduate, this is, I'm not making this up. Humanities undergraduates at Harvard dramatically improved their writing. The English, literature, history uh, majors. The social science students, like economists and so on, pretty pretty good improvement, pretty much improvement. The physical science students, zero, zero over four years. The end of this story, I don't wanna go on too long with this. The end of this story is, there was a faculty meeting of the faculty for Harvard College, Faculty of Arts and Sciences. They added two 
required writing courses to the curriculum for all the physical science students. Every student had to basically do some writing. So here's again my, my specific concrete example. Finally, I want to give one example from the Kennedy School because it's a slight example. Slate, for those of you who don't know, some of you know very well, because you work at Slate, several of you. Anyway, um, Slate stands for Strengthening Learning and Teaching Excellence. It's 13 years of work by a whole lot of people at the Kennedy School. These folks are in the second row, or there's the leader, our leader of Slate. Anyway, the idea just is, um, we did, I was part of it, we did an actual project at the Kennedy School just like what I'm describing, and I'll keep this short, but let me just say, we asked every single Kennedy School MPP student, the day they arrived, a series of questions. Some were narrow, like example, what's the definition of a randomized controlled field trial? I mean, either you know it or you don't. Some of you may not know it. Some of you may know it, great. Right. But it's sort of a, I know it or I don't. Then there's a second level of question, which involves a little bit more complexity. And then there's a third level question, which asks students to pull together ideas from different fields, synthesize, aggregate across fields. The exact same questions were given at the end of that same academic year, you know, late April, early May. The students were asked, take an hour, answer the same questions. What did the Kennedy School learn? We learned, and everyone here was very interested because it's, you know, here we are at the Kennedy School. We learned that students are learning details brilliantly. The students gain enormous amounts of knowledge when it comes to details. And then when you go to the other extreme, synthesizing, aggregating, pulling it all together, uh, they, they do better at the end than at the beginning. They do, you know, they do get better. But not as much better as they get on the details. So a whole faculty committee was formed, shared by my friend here at the Kennedy School, my colleague Jack Donahue. What are we going to do about this? And you know, I'll stop the story there. But the point just is, why isn't every college and university in the United States doing this? This is not hard. Giving a one-hour test in August, giving a one-hour test in May, at the end of the year, to the same students with the same questions and seeing what do the students learn, what don't they learn? You tell me why, do you know how many colleges and universities there are in America? Two, about 2,800. I may be a little bit old, but, and that includes famous places and places, you know, you never heard of, and I never heard of. But the point just is, why isn't every place doing this to get a sense of what are their students learning? What could we do better in terms of enhancing the student experience? I'm going to keep going now. Next example. I'm waiting for one of you to raise your hand and I'm waiting for one of you to ask me a question. The question, I'll help you out. The question, I'm just joking a little bit here. The, qu the question is, um, What's the biggest change in how faculty members, how professors, I mean, kind of like me and my many colleagues all around, how, do, what are, how are professors doing things differently now from what they used to do 20 and 30 and 40 years ago? I mean, things, they update their curriculum, but what about their behavior? And let me just get right to the, the bottom, the main point. Professors increasingly are trying new ways of teaching. I am unfortunately lecturing a little bit to you. I'm trying to do it with a smile, but I'm just sort of getting the information out. But the point just is increasingly professors are trying new things. I'm happy to give you a simple example of something I tried four years ago. And I have so, there are so many other people who tried similar things. I was asked, would I teach a first year student seminar, the so-called freshman seminar? The enrollment is only 14. I had seven men, seven women in the class. You know, just I lucked out, it was good. So anyway, we met once a week for three hours and I led a discussion and it always got pretty high ratings from the students. They seemed to like it. And I 
I measured how many hours a week do they work. I'll come to that in two seconds. A, a few years ago, with strong encouragement from the Harvard leadership, the idea was to many faculty members, try something new, you know, do role playing, simulations, um, you know, use clickers for voting, just any try, try new things. So instead of leading a discussion for three hours with these young men and with the, fr the first year students, I reduced what I do to two and a half hours. It was the same course. We used the same room. We sat around the same table that we did the year before. But the next time I taught it, my second time, the last half hour, I assigned a man and a woman to team up. They don't have to like each other. I just needed them to work together to lead a discussion of the entire class for the remaining half hour. And I say, as a group, they were a bit taken aback when I first introduced it. Within two weeks, it was very clear. They really were into it. So what, people were talking more. The students were, always came to class better prepared. They spent more hours reading the assignment outside of class before they showed up. And in other words, everything was really good. I did have one awkward moment. The awkward moment was, I just said, I teamed up a young man, young woman, boy and a girl. Halfway through, I was actually invited with my wife to a dinner party. And in the middle of the dinner party, I mean, this is, you know, older folks like me, it's not about students. And in the middle of the dinner party, um, our, our wonderful host said, I want every gentleman, those were her exact words, I want every gentleman to move two seats to his left. And you know, I'm sort of looking around, why, why, why are you suggesting that? I'm thinking, I didn't say it out loud. Anyway, it then became obvious, you want to sit with different people for the second half of the dinner, make a couple new friends, how nice. So I thought I'm going to do the same thing in my class. I stole the idea. And I said, now we're going to change the pairs, the men and the women. And for the rest of the semester, you're going to have a different pair. Everybody said, great, but there was one pair who really resisted, and this was all very public in front of everyone else. No, we have fallen in love. You can't break us up. We're really into our dating relationship. I'm not making this up. And so the point just is, you know, I finally insisted and, you know, they laughed good spiritedly and that was the end of it. But it was very, it was just entertaining for the class. And boy, did they work hard. They ended up spending more hours and you know, again, came to class. I asked a few of them, it seems to me you're talking a lot more than most students talk. Why is that? And they said, because even though someone else is leading the conversation today, I know my turn will come in two or three weeks. I want everyone else to be well prepared. So I figure I owe it to my fellow students for me to come well prepared. Uh, I, we, we actually collected some data. Instead of spending about four or five hours a week on the preparation, they spent about roughly six to seven. So another you know, hour or two every week on the preparation. So that's my one very specific example. Let me try to make one more point that I'll stop because I've been talking for quite a while now. One other thing that distinguishes, at least in my judgment, great universities from pretty good Great universities do research on effective ways of teaching. Example, I'll mention some names some of you may have recognized. Example, um, I assume you all know what cold calling is. You know, I sort of call on someone and I have no idea. I may not even know who they are at the beginning. And the point is they don't know they're gonna be called on. I don't just call on someone who raises their hands. Does cold calling lead to more student learning. A project studying that was led right here in this building, well, or next door at the Litauer building in the Kennedy School by my colleague and friend, Dan Levy, Professor Dan Levy, who for years has taught in the MPP core curriculum. And he found, I won't do the experimental design, I'll just give you the results. He found to his great surprise, Cold calling does not 
increase student learning. I would have bet, I mean me, I would have bet it does increase learning. I would have been wrong. But that's the great thing about gathering data. Sometimes you're wrong and you actually learn something. How about another project that was done here at the Kennedy School by a group of people? And that is, you know how sometimes when you have a reading, if you're a student, you're asked to go online and post a short response to the reading, you know, post it by 2 a.m. the night before, that kind of thing. Does that improve student learning? I would have guessed, of course. What's the answer? No, or if it improves it, you know, it improves it by 1%. Basically, no, no real difference. Students said they spend a lot more time on the class, but they don't seem to learn more in any measurable way. I'll stop with that example. What I'm trying to convey is doing a bit of experimentation. It takes a bit of work. It takes a bit of intentionality, purpose, but there's no college or university that I can think of in America, I'll even say in the world, that can't afford to do it. Maybe what I should do at this point, I have more to say here, but I, you know, I, I should know when to subside. My, my family members tell me I never know when to subside. Maybe now is a good time to subside. And I'm gonna sit back down and invite your comments or questions or criticisms or reactions. And I'm serious, please feel free to say that doesn't sound right. I'm not offended, I've heard it all. If folks would like. All right, uh, Dan, please. I have a question, but I don't want to preempt, preempt others. Um, but maybe, maybe question, two, two questions and comments. Uh, fascinating, uh, Dick, I learned, learned a tremendous amount as I have from your other, your other writings. Um, so, so two two comments slash questions. One is on costs, and I think when you talk about costs, you mean dollars and cents. And my sense, my guess is that for a lot of administrators, it's not about the dollars and cents, but rather about opportunity costs, skills, and the time and effort to follow up. Um, and I just just that as a as a comment, and that that opportunity Please, cost is different at an elite institution which has a lot of administrators and a lot of helpers and a lot of staff and say a community college. So that just I wonder how you how you thought about that. That was one thing. The other thing I, I your your uh, comments about how to make a, a great university seem focused on the student experience, which I yes, that, that is right. That seems outstanding and I'm very happy about that. But I was I was uh, curious not to hear more about <laughs> um yeah, for example research. Uh, not on how to teach, but rather on all the myriad of topics we cover at a university um, and faculty and administrative support for that. So I'm, what's brought to mind for me is the case of Gang Chun, the professor at the MIT, who was falsely accused by the Department of Justice of some espionage related to China, and MIT came out right away in support of him. And I think that sent a powerful message to faculty that they would be supported in their international research collaborations. And I strongly suspect that had a really positive impact on international research collaborations. And we know that international science is, is the best. Uh, it's cited the best and it's, it's, it's cited the most and has the biggest impact. So I'd, I'd just those two uh, comments, both on cost and the place of research in your, in your work of making a great university. Thank you. Thank you for a very good question. I actually have a question back for you. <laughs> are you, you are probably aware that Harvard is now looking for a new president. Are you willing to be a candidate? <laughs> sure. No, because you're asking very good, you're making good points. I'm making, you know, saying this with a smile, you can't see my big smile here. But anyway, here goes. Um, let me try to answer. First of all, I'm, I'm going to focus on your first question, which is the student piece, rather than the how do faculty do research more effectively and more productively because that's a whole other topic and we it just, it's not part of this book. Um, but what I will say is um, you commented correctly that it's not always for many, many campuses, it's not just about money. You just said it's about faculty time, you know, who's really willing to come to a dinner meeting, that kind of thing. And you know, that it takes precious time. Wouldn't you rather be home with your kids? I mean, you know, for many people, that's what they'd say. Okay, I, you know, I'm, I could say that. Anyway, but here's my, here's my reply. This is a great example 
Think about, again, we're sitting at the Kennedy School of Government. What's the one magic word that is used over and over and over? And I mean, it's a good word. It's a happy word. And it's the word leadership. That's why most of our students here at the Kennedy School are here. That leader at the business school, there were leaders in business at the ed school, leaders in education, and so on. So the idea is, why are they here to be leaders? This is where a leader can make a real difference. And I'm going to tell you my personal story. And that's the first president of Harvard who invited me to do this stuff, you know, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, was, some of you know the name, some of you may not know the name, Derek Bach, B-O-K. He was a very distinguished president for many years. He invited me to do this. I said, sure. And I started doing it. And I, I said, well, I'm going to convene about 30 people. We met upstairs in the penthouse of the, um, I guess it was of the Lit Tower building, in the Malkin penthouse of the Lit Tower building. We met once a month. Derek Bach, being a great leader, said to me, you know, he said, Dick, I'm inviting you to take a leadership role. I said, yes, I accept with pleasure. And he said, I have a question for you. Do you want me to come to these gatherings of 35 faculty and senior staff? And I said, let me think about that. There's an argument, you know, on all different sides. And then I thought about it and I said, the answer, yes, please come at least to our first few monthly meetings. And he said, I'm curious why you said yes. I'm happy to come. I'm glad you said yes. Why do you want me to come? I said, if you come, and then I actually screwed up my courage, and I said, and if you talk a little bit, that will convey to everybody in the room that the president of Harvard cares about our spending our precious time doing this. Well, if the president of Harvard cares, you know, gee, I ought to be willing to invest a little bit of time. You also asked about how much does it cost, or, you know, is it, it, you mentioned cost. I posed to him, what budget do you have to do this? And he started laughing. And he said, here's the budget I can offer to start. He said, I can offer to provide tuna fish sandwiches and Diet Coke and Pepsi and water. You know, we'll meet over dinner. And he said, the cost is, you know, it's rounding error for not just Harvard, but for most campuses. And that's what it was. I mean, literally, you know, turkey or tuna fish, it would vary by the month. But it basically cost a few thousand dollars for the whole year, very little even for a, a campus with a low endowment. Good, let me move on. If there are other questions, I warmly welcome them. Make them hard, please, go ahead. So I'm thinking about how these cultural factors can be put into structures, right? How can a culture of giving students agency be built into the rules, the organization itself, so that it doesn't rely on individual faculty, staff, people coming to students saying, yeah, you can totally do this. Do you have thoughts on what that can look like? How you can effectively build structures that promote the culture you want in these ways? I love your question. And the answer is I do have a real example. And I'll tell you then again, I'm, you know, there's none of this is secret. It's all public information. The University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia does a great job. I want to praise them to the skies um, for, um, for building this culture of agency where everyone on campus from the 18 year old new first year student to the you know 75 or 80 year old full professor who's been there forever. Everybody feels they're contributing to the community. Here's a real example. At the University of Pennsylvania, they have a debate team. Now I should just say, I, me, Richard Light, I never was part of any debate team. I, I'm no expert on debating. You know, I've seen a couple on TV, that's sort of it. Anyway. Penn has, as Harvard does, as Ohio State does, they have a debate team. Penn has a debate team consisting of 10 people. One year, they had about 40 students show up to try out, to make, to be selected to join the debate team. Obviously, the leaders of the debate team wanted to choose the students who were the best debaters. It's understandable. Penn is competing against other universities. You want good debaters. But the 30 students who were turned away very kindly and graciously, but they were turned away. You know, they basically, they were very nicely told, go away. You know, you're not, you didn't make it. 
Um, the debate team leader said to the, to the people who made it, why don't you volunteer to tutor, to work with, I mean, those who are interested, to work with some of the you know, folks who were turned away, they can try again next year, maybe they'll make the team. And they did that. And a whole lot of the debaters who made the team felt they were, you know, they met two or three hours a week with some other person who knew less than they did about debating. And they felt they were contributing to the overall enhancement of student life on the campus. And the young folks who got the tutoring, who didn't make the debate team in their first try, they were just grateful. And, you know, they made new friends. I mean, everyone wins. How, my favorite question, repetitive as it is, how much did that cost, Penn, to implement? I think the exact number to the eighth decimal place is zero. So why isn't every campus in America doing, it doesn't have to be the debate team, it could be the mountain climbing club. But, you know, why doesn't, why isn't everybody doing it? Is that a re I mean, I hope that roughly answers it. Any campus can just sort of figure out creative ways uh, to do things. Okay. Please, love. Thanks, Professor. Um, I really liked the case study examples that you presented, and they've kind of got me thinking about, well, why is it that universities don't implement these initiatives? And I wanted to get your views on whether potentially the barriers are at the student level in terms of a disconnect between perhaps what students need and what students actually want, um, or is it more structural in terms of the university incentives and their um, push in rankings or what are the sort of incentives that drive the university administration? Just repeat your last sentence. I got, I got the earlier part. I wonder whether it's the students or the universities themselves and the pressures that they face in terms of performance, university rankings, and what their incentives are. I think that that's a, it's actually you're asking a question I had not thought of before. It's a really interesting question. Let me give you my best, you know, my the best I can do, and that is, um, I think it's the, the universities that are not trying hard. It's as simple as they're not trying hard. I wish I could say something more than that. Um, and and um, it takes a certain amount of purpose, effort, intentionality, not money. I mean, maybe a little bit money, but that's not the big one. It takes effort and purpose and focus to try new things. Um, and uh, I, can just, I can just report what John Haig, when he introduced me, he commented, I started the thing called the Harvard Assessment Seminars. That's the item that I just told you about where Derek Bach and 35 Harvard faculty and staff, including deans, we all met up here in the penthouse at the Kennedy School. And the point just is, um, somebody had to take the initiative. It wasn't me. In this case, it was President Bach said, let's do some extra work. Let's meet. The faculty said, gee, if President Buck is coming, I'd love to have dinner with the president every month. This is good. So they ended up coming. It's kind of, again, it's, it's a, I think it's more on the institution. And I'm going to say one last thing. Um, this is a new point. It's related to your question, but it's, an, it's something I didn't say earlier. Many of you, perhaps not all of you, went to colleges and universities that were primarily residential, meaning most of the students live either on campus or short and near campus. They can come to campus events. Now, I wanna ask you all a question that I did not ask yet today. Um, how many hours are there in a week? Actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on you because you asked your good questions. Ready? How many hours are there in a week? I know you think about that all the time. 168, is that right? Did you say 168? Right. Perfect. Seven days, 24 hours. Just sit there, do the arithmetic. It's 168. How many hours did each of you attend your classes? How many hours at the at any Harvard school, Kennedy School or any other? How many hours do students spend attending class? Each, each week, 12, 14, 16, 10? You know, they come three, four hours a week. You take four courses, it's about 14, 12 hours, whatever it is. All right, so 168 hours a week. Students are in class, say, 12, 14 hours. That means they're spending over 150 hours. That's 90% of their time outside of class. A, a feature that distinguishes great universities from the not so great are the seriousness with which the leadership of that campus 
makes an effort to enrich campus life outside of the classroom. Let me, I'm going to keep picking on you. Ready? I'm, I, I, <laughs> it's the biggest compliment I can give. Okay, here goes. Ready? I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep going. Um, you're you're the victim now. Uh, seriously, I won't ask where you went to university. It's, you know, that's not the important thing. I'll just, I'll just ask. Did you ever receive any advice how to constructively criticize a fellow student or a colleague? Almost none. Pardon me? Almost none in my undergraduate degree. You're saying none of that? Yeah, zero. Okay, well, that's true of most campuses, zero. I could keep going. How many of you learned when you were in university or college, undergraduate, how to break bad news to a group? Met, oh, look, one, one person actually, you, that's amazing. Good for you for, for getting that. Very few people obviously get it. I just made, I asked about how to give feedback to a colleague. How many of you got some suggestions about how do you receive friendly, constructive advice and criticism from your colleagues? What are good ways to be thinking when you're receiving constructive, friendly criticism? My boy, so wherever you went, and this is- Where did you go? Wash U in St. Louis. Wash U in St. Good for Washington University, St. Louis. I did not know that. That's great. Anyway, can I just say most campuses don't offer that. Is that taught in chemistry class? No. Is it taught in economics class? No. But just think, you know, breaking bad news. How do you write a tight executive summary? When, when you're uh, going for a job interview, what are a couple of things you do want to do? What are a couple of things you don't want to do? It's just very practical. Very, it has nothing to do with chemistry or history or, or anything like that. I think you get the idea. So and there we are. Other, I'm going to keep going if there are other questions. Please talk loud so I can hear you. Well, I can stand up. So hi, Professor Lai. Uh, I'm actually from your class, and um, I'm asking from an educational perspective because I'm an education student, and uh, because we talk about the cost, and uh, I just I, I don't know if this is ridiculous. I just wonder, like, why don't universities open all resources to the public? For example, like we um, in Harvard. We live stream all the classes uh, online and we'll create a site named like Harvard Online. And uh, being a member of that site, you can kind of like uh, look through all the courses. And if I click this, this course and I say, ah, oh, this is not interesting, and I just change to like another one, watch for like five minutes, or like I can just like look through every classes. And to be a member of that site, I need to pay $2,000 a month or something. And um, so after maybe a semester, the only thing you can get is like a certificate saying that you are a auditor of Harvard so that we can kind of make money. And also being a professor, you don't need to pay any more effort because they, the only thing they can get is the access and they, they cannot ask questions, they cannot do homework and the professors doesn't need to, do not need to do anything else and we can make money. So, why don't we just open this to the public? Got it. Thank you for your comment. I have two quick reactions because your question is a little bit complicated, but but I have, I'm going to have two two reactions to your good question. My first reaction, you mentioned online. I just think the single biggest challenge facing just about any college or university, you know, Wash U in St. Louis or Harvard or, you know, Penn State, just pick it out of a hat. Um, it, the biggest challenge is how to incorporate the technology and the online learning at, um, for students so they really benefit from it, but also so it reduces cost. And my favorite example is, suppose a Harvard student, one of you right now, actually an undergraduate, an undergraduate went to President Larry Bachow at Harvard and said, I have a great proposal. Instead of four years in person on campus, paying full tuition, <coughs> how about we pay three quarters tuition and we do one year online and you can test us, do we, you know, do we, did we learn the material or not? And we can save one quarter of the tuition. That's the kind, I don't have a cute answer to that. I'm just saying that it's a hard, it's a hard question. It probably depends upon the, the university, the student, the goal and so on. So 
that's uh, I just want to say that's my first uh, comment. You mentioned the word auditor in the second part of your question. Uh, you're asking, I may not be the right person to ask. I'm not a fan of auditors. In fact, I don't allow any auditors in any of my classes. And there's a reason. The ticket of admission is you have to contribute. Um, I actually tell first year undergraduates at Harvard College, the 19 year olds, the 18 year olds, if you're gonna go and go to a big lecture class and sit in silence behind a pole in row 56, never opening your mouth, why bother? Why don't you just go on YouTube and take the economics course and leave it at that? And you know you can do it for free. And so you may not agree with me, I understand. Many people don't agree with me. But the point is this, for me, the ticket of admission is talking. For those of you who don't know about it, this is, here's a bit of information. At Harvard Business School, 50, 5 0, 50% 50 of every student's grade comes from their contributions, verbal contributions in class. So the student, it could be an American student, it could be an international student, it doesn't matter, either way, writes the best written final exam of anyone in a class, but he never opened his mouth a single time, C minus. Now you may strongly disagree. I happen to agree, I think it's great. I think you know the way we move the world forward is everybody needs to contribute, not just sit hiding behind a pole in row 56. Okay, maybe time for one more and we'll approach our conclusion. Good, well, two more, please go ahead and then. <laughs> thank you so much. Just talk loud, it's just my hearing. Of course, um, thank you. I'm wondering as we talk about digital learning and I know that a lot of the arguments made by colleges as well as offices for coming back to work or learn in person is that being in person with your colleagues or coworkers can really contribute to that culture that you talked about. Do you think that these mechanisms that you've discussed can be transmitted as effectively digitally, or do you think that that physical space plays a large role? Funny you should ask. I do have an answer and it's really specific to your very good question. Yesterday evening, where was I from seven to 9 p.m.? I was sitting in my kitchen laptop computer on, on the kitchen table. I was teaching a course. It has 14 students in it and it was it's on Zoom. And um, one of the first questions I asked was, I said, I could meet in person. I mean, I'd have to, we'd have to be masked, but basically I could meet in person or we could continue meeting on Zoom. Which do you prefer? Let's vote. And they voted. What did I say? I think it was 15 students. The vote was 15 to zero in favor of Zoom. And I said, I can't resist asking why that cuts against what most people would guess. And a gentleman named Steed said, I work at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. If we met in person on the Harvard campus, I'd have to get in my car, drive an hour and a half, spend two hours in this very enjoyable class and then get back in my car and drive home. I'd be home 11 at night. Um, frankly, this is easier. And you know, others said similar things. What one, uh, I'll, I was, I'm trying to, should I say this? One woman was sitting, this is a graduate student, was sitting in a completely <clears throat> dark room. And I just said, Grace is her name. And I said, Grace, are you safe there? You look like you're in a totally dark area. And you know, it's like nine at night. And she said, I feel totally safe. I'm in a Harvard building and the security guy is right down the hall. Anyway, but my, my point just is, you know, it, it leads to idiosyncratic things. Using techniques online, such as breakout groups, breakout rooms, I think you can capture most of it. I mean, you know, there's never your replacing, you're looking at Aaron and saying, let's have a cup of coffee. You just can't quite replace that. Uh, you know, I think everybody understands. But I'm a big fan of a reasonable level of online learning, especially if it allows people to get access to classes that they might not otherwise choose. Okay, last question. You had your hand. I'll try to be brief and speak up. Um, so going back to this question about why do not more universities do this, engage in these kinds of activities. 
And to go back to your first example, or the first one that I heard, I came a little late, was um, you know, the question asking students, what do they really know after four years here? Right. But it seems to me that there was a question that preceded that question, which was, what do we really know? I'm sorry, what do, what, what do we really know? The teachers, the, teachers, the, faculty, the, faculty, the faculty, faculty, the administrators, the leaders. What do we really know about how we are teaching and what people are doing? And I think my question to you is, would you agree that all of this begins with the capacity and the willingness to question professional epistemology? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I right. think that's perfectly put. And that is part of the university culture. I mean, the very fact you're even posing this question. Um, I'm gonna be unkind. I've been so kind this whole time. So now I'm gonna say one unkind thing. It's not about anybody here. I visited a public university one hour north of Minneapolis, St. Cloud State University. And I made to the faculty leaders, I mean, they invited me to come. I was their cordial guest. I was delighted to come. I had a very nice time. The point is St. Cloud State is not Harvard. It just is, you know, we could pretend, but it's not. Um, and the idea just is, I sort of made your point, a willingness to question about, you know, what are we willing to do? And I actually had a person with a straight face say, our faculty union would not allow that. Um, I, I tried to keep a straight face. I said nothing and we moved on to the next question. I'm not saying this to beat up on unions. That's not my goal. I'm just saying that's an example of one campus and one incident where they're basically saying, you know, that's, it doesn't work here. It does, it's not about unions. It could have been our president doesn't, our culture, right? yeah, our culture doesn't allow that. I, I don't want to come across as anti-union. That's not my goal, um, but it is about the culture. Okay, John, should we? Um, uh, I just want to thank everybody for coming. And in particular, I want to thank Dick.